So I do have 631 here Eastern time. So um, for those of you on different time zones, I'm always going to default to Eastern. So I apologize if I don't do the math and get your correct time zone. Um, but I'm Cindy Finneseth with the Kentucky Horticulture Council. And thanks so much for joining us today. Um, this is one of our um, part of a series that we've been doing in collaboration with the University of Kentucky um, to offer some short courses uh, for cut flower growers. And for those of you who've been joining us, um, this is kind of the same format that we've been following. Um, for those of you who are new to this, um, you know, we'll start out, um, we have a little bit of um, Kentucky centric information that we'll cover first, and then we'll get into our speaker. And then we're really excited today because we this is the first time we've had a grower panel. So we're super excited to have five different growers with us tonight to talk about their personal experiences. And we really appreciate them sharing that with us. So we'll just hop right in. I want to introduce Josh Knight, and he's with the UK Center for Crop Diversification. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, you should be seeing my screen there. And I'm just going to run through a couple of slides. Won't take more than a minute. Um, but uh, just to remind you, or if this is your first one of these, we have um, at the Center for Crop Diversification a landing page to kind of collect all of our cut flower resources. And even if you're not in Kentucky, you might find uh, some useful resources there. Um, and like I said, I'm Josh Knight. I work at the CCD and at UK. Um, so we've got things like crop profiles there. Some of them are uh, specific to certain types of production, like greenhouse grown or field grown cut flowers, um, woody cuts, things like that. Uh, we got some irrigation resources uh, for basic stuff, you know, whether you're setting up something that's kind of off the grid with a low flow system and rainwater catchment or a simple drip irrigation setup. Uh, we got those kind of resources there. Uh, we've got a lot of videos there. Some are on uh, sort of how to topics. And we also uh, record and post these uh, within 24 hours. So all of the uh, earlier short course material is up online that you can view and review and kind of go and see, check out those other topics. Um, and we got some, some budgets up and more are coming. Uh, one that's relatively recently been added is adding in a cut flower component to a CSA production system. Um, so that's new. And we got some resources that for, were developed out at Utah for uh, budgets for Snapdragons. And we've also got a map uh, for uh, Kentucky commercial cut flower growers. And we update that on a yearly basis around cut flower month uh, that links people to the social media resources and pages of our commercial cut flower growers and shows you where they are around the state. And again, uh, these resources are available at the uh, cut flower kind of landing page at the CCD. We can drop that in the link and you can check that out anytime. All right, thank you so much, Josh. Dakota, do you wanna give a little highlight of um, some of the things we have going on with the social media? Yeah, uh, thanks, Cindy. My name is Dakota Moore. I'm with the Kentucky Horticulture Council. Um, and we have uh, recently started a Facebook group for all things uh, cut flower promotion in Kentucky. Uh, so we've got things like uh, cut flower facts, some tips and tricks for post uh, purchase care, uh, post harvest care. And we've also got some of those uh, links to resources that Josh uh, just talked about. Um, and as well as uh, videos of these webinars we've been doing. And so I'm going to drop that in the chat. It's uh, anyone can join. Uh, it's a public group. Um, it's for growers, uh, people that just are enthusiastic about cut flowers. Uh, it's also for customers. So it's a way for us to promote uh, Kentucky growers as well. Uh, and I'll also drop the link for our uh, cut flower month. Uh, Kentucky Grown Cut Flower Month promotion. Uh, so this is for Kentucky cut flower growers to nominate themselves and they'll be featured in this group uh, throughout the month of July. So I'll, I'll drop those two in the chat. And um, I also uh, wanna plug, if you go to the Center for Crop Diversification's YouTube uh, channel, you can see last month's webinar on selling to florists as well as past uh, webinars we've done on production. 
And so uh, that's it. And I'll drop those in the chat. All right, fantastic. So what everybody's been waiting for, right? So we are so excited to have Dr. Melanie Stock here with us today. And she's an assistant professor, uh, urban and small farms extension specialist at Utah State University. Uh, she's a soil scientist by training and her lab focuses on high value crops like cut flowers. And her research program focuses on adapting cut flower crops for Utah, but we can all learn from that because it's basic cultivation cultivation methods to nutrient management and um, physics-based season extension, overwintering and water use efficiency. So we are so lucky to have Dr. Stock with us tonight or this afternoon for her to provide some insight for us on the science and art of pricing cut flowers. Melanie? Oh, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Cindy. And thank you all for being here. Um, I'm so excited to be able to talk to you all this afternoon slash evening. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here um, to talk about the art and science of pricing. So as Cindy said, there's a big disclaimer here. I am a soil scientist and not an economist, um, but when I started working here at Utah State, I realized what a, a big industry uh, local cut flowers has become. And I work a lot with economists here. So they have schooled me time and time again so that I can share a little bit, but they're the true experts. Um, so I just want to uh, say that I'm. this is our talk, Art and Science of Pricing. I'm going to talk for a good half hour, maybe 40 minutes on some of the things we've learned here, but I also want to recognize our grower panel um, because we have three growers from Utah, got my Utah crew, and then we have um, some wonderful growers from Kentucky uh, and, to, and really true stars of the field. So thank you all for being here. And I, I just, I think it's so cool to look at the bottom of this uh, page and see all the icons um, and how we're all coming together. So all the different groups. So to see, today's topics, I wanna share a little bit about the Utah scene because I think that Kentucky and Utah are really on the same trajectory. And I feel like between our two states, if we get to know each other a little bit better, I have a feeling we'll be seeing more of each other first off. And I think that we can all learn a lot from each other um, and that we'll probably be, we're very different states, but we'll be seeing some similar trends. So I just wanted to introduce us a little bit. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the different types of pricing as I have learned from the economists. Um, we're gonna really focus a lot on cost-based pricing. Uh, for budget considerations. And in the Q, or excuse me, the questions that were submitted with your registration, there were a lot that focused on enterprise budgets, which is just music to my ears. Um, every time we do a cut flower production trial here at Utah State, we work with our economists, we track all of our different expenses, um, we sell, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and the help that we get in selling and so that we can actually convey the bottom line. So I'll be able to share some kind of tips and tricks that we've learned along the way um, for record keeping, things to consider, some sources on price estimates. Um, maybe one of the frustrating things about this talk is that I'm not going to just have a list that says ranunculus should always be sold a dollar fifty per sum wholesale and so forth. We're not going to give you concrete numbers necessarily, maybe in some cases, um, but really how to figure out what that sustainable pricing is for your farm. Um, and then the best part of this. Uh, webinar, I think, is the is Farmer Talk, the, the panel Q&A. And so what I've done is I've looked through all of your questions from registration, or many of them at least, and I tried to group them uh, into different categories so we can really dive into um, what the key questions are. Uh, I like to keep things really casual, so it's hard for me to look at the chat while I'm talking, but if there's anything that's confusing and you really would like me to stop and talk about it before we move on, I say feel free to put it in the chat and I'll try to stop, keep an eye on that and stop. And, um, and if anyone in the group also could, the panel could take a look at the chat too. That way, you know, we're not getting stuck before we move on. So happy to answer questions as we go. Otherwise we'll plan on also answering more questions toward the end of the webinar. So that's our timeline uh, in our roadmap for today. So the Utah cut flower scene, I think is like the Kentucky flower scene in that it is suddenly growing rapidly. It's this amazing dynamic industry um, that's really taking agriculture by hold. So I started formally tracking cut flower farms in Utah in 2019. Um, we had 47 farms. So this is the, a map of our state by county. And you'll see that certain counties are, oh, looks like I maybe switched two of the maps. 
Um, it, you can see that some of our counties, so the darker color means there's more cut flower farms. Those are really around our urban hubs. Um, so sorry, 2020, this is actually our 2021 map that goes over here. Um, but right in the center of it is Salt Lake County. So Salt Lake City is right here. Uh, Park City is nearby, big ski hub, big tourist hub. And then the county to the south, this is Utah County. So this is where BYU is or Provo, Orem. These are also big uh, cut flower markets. And then we're starting to see some growth in the Southwest St. George area. So it's really growing along our urban hubs. And just, just for the record, Utah State is right up here in Cache County in the Northern part. Um, so we're growing by a, a good 20 to 30 farms per year, every year from what I can tell. They're primarily small farms. We're kind of uh, defining micro farms here. And we did some economic analysis this winter and it's really exciting that every dollar spent on Utah cut flowers is adding an additional 80 cents to our economy. So it, it generates a dollar 80 um, in our economy. And I'm really curious what it's like in Kentucky and surrounding states. And if you'd like to just put some comments into the chat, we'd love to read those and find out what you think it's like um, in your state. And if you're not in Kentucky or Utah, we wanna know no matter where you are, what, what's it like in your area? How are things growing? Um, so relatively new industry, we have a cut flower farm association uh, that was established in 2019. We have um, our president and vice president who are actually on the, the farmer panel today. And it's really exciting that it's grown to 120 members. I take no credit for this. This is all of our cut flower farmers um, really working together to create a network um, that's just been amazing. We, when I work with uh, people who have been here a lot longer than me, particularly economists, who worked across different industries from vegetables to beef to whatever, they're always remark at what an amazing and unique community Cut Flowers is because of this network that's really close knit and willing to share information. Um, so most of our uh, Cut Flower farmers start off at the farmer's market. Uh, the last time we did this survey was in 2020, so it could have changed a bit, um, but 62% uh, listed some sort of market, primarily farmer's market as their main market. Um, and this is, this is uh, I think it's, it's a nice thing because oftentimes when we get into cut flower farming, we're not sure what cut flowers are gonna sell particularly well, or you'll see all of this information out there on what is so beautiful and, and intriguing to grow. So it's a nice venue for being able to grow a bit of everything instead of specializing in one crop that you might not know if it'll make it later on. Um, it also helps build name and clientele. And I'd love to have towards the end at the panel um, the cut flower farmers talk a little bit about this. One of the things I noticed in, when we first started working together is how much education was happening at the, at the farmer's market on the value of cut flowers that are grown locally and why flow, uh, grown, not flown is so important. Um, so it really has helped increase awareness. After establishment, uh, we found that a lot of the cut flower farms are going wholesale, They're primarily selling to florists. Um, and admittedly, our USD research has focused on wholesale a bit more. Um, it's just a bit easier for pricing on our end versus at farmer's markets. Um, but this requires a little bit more of honing in on, what, on a few things and there can be stricter quality standards and so forth. So that's just been the trend. I think that's pretty true though across um, the nation, but then there's of course many other ways to diversify. And in our, our polls of cut flower farmers and um, what their farm incomes are like, those who diversified ended up, uh, tended to have higher, um, higher income per unit land by diversifying into different markets. So CSAs, pop-ups, events, classes, that sort of thing. So that's a little bit about what it's like. Hopefully that resonates a bit with you too. Um, in other states, I, I think similar things are happening. Um, so one thing I wanted to, to comment on too that I've noticed with our cut flower farmers is uh, just that we've had such amazing growth. And I think the first question that becomes of it is what's competition gonna be like? If there's all of these cut flower farms setting up shop and here in Utah, we're sandwiched between some mountains and the Great Salt Lake. So it's a pretty narrow bit of land where we can actually be farming together. Uh, so what's the competition like? Do we have to be worried about other cut flower farms? I feel like there can be a lot of insecurity, rightfully so, in that when we see all of this growth. So this winter, um, we actually polled, or we did a survey with uh, florists in Utah. And I just wanna say, this is so interesting. One of the questions we asked is, what percent of flowers that you used in 2021 were sourced from local farms or growers? 
So they, they got those flowers uh, that were locally grown within 150 miles from their business. So we just focused on florists in Utah and surrounding states so they could be um, within a half hour of our border. And so I wanted to point out this, this table represents the same information as the bar graph. 14% said none, 36% said 10% or fewer uh, were sourced local. Okay, and then there were some, some florists who were sourcing more uh, locally as well, but just look at these numbers here on the low end. The next question we asked is in 2022, what percent of your flowers would you like to source locally? And check this out, nobody said none. Only 7% said 10% or fewer. Um, but look at this, there's so many who want to source more from local farms. Um, so there's a, what this tells us and what it tells the economists is that even though we have rapid growth in our state, which I think everybody does, there's a lot of room in the market. Um, and who knows what that can be with additional education to the public. So that's just a really exciting thing about this industry. And then I wanted to point out also that we asked them what the florists, what they thought the benefits were from so sourcing local. And I listed these in order of um, what was most popularly selected by the florist. Because if you're thinking about marketing to florists, these might be things to put in your pitch. Um, many were really invested in supporting in our local economy. It's well known that local flowers have superior quality, they're unique. Um, and these are all things that florists were looking for, especially with this millennial uh, generation. Oh, excuse me. All right, so these are some of the benefits that they see from sourcing local. Of course, there's others. Um, and then these were just some overall just thoughts coming from the wholesale market. Uh, what some of the preferences were. We found that a lot of florists have really close relationships with farms. They're really just sourcing from two to four. We don't know if that's because they don't know of more farms or they just have that close relationship and are getting enough of what they need. We asked about if they'd be willing to pay more than uh, wholesale. And by wholesale, we're really kind of thinking about that Boston terminal market pricing. I'll talk more about what that is later, um, but there were a lot of questions about Boston terminal market in the, in the registration. And asking someone how much they're willing to pay and if they're willing to pay more than they pay now is a really tricky question because most business people wouldn't want to give that information away. So most were saying at least over 5%. Some said they wouldn't pay more, but we were shocked that some even said that they would pay up to 20% more. So there certainly can be a markup for local pricing, um, but that's really something you don't normally find out in a survey. But these were their challenges for sourcing local. In a, a, it really, really, really came down to supply. So I just wanna put that out there to put people maybe at ease a little bit to say that we're growing rapidly as an industry across the US. And I think that um, there's just so much room in the market and it continues to grow as that awareness for local flowers um, expands. The other kind of interesting thing, at least from our florists, is that the quantity requirements um, in a single purchase isn't that much. So when we're thinking of bunches of five or 10, depending on the crop type, they're just looking for a few bunches typically uh, in, in some cases. So anyway, so now I wanna get into um, some specifics. And this is where I really need to point out Dr. Curtis and Dr. Ward, because these are the two ag economists who have worked on this tremendously. It's really their work um, who deserves this credit. I've just been lucky to be able to work with them on the production side. And what we've been finding here at Utah State uh, is that cut flowers can be very worth it to produce. Um, truly, they're redefining the profit potential for small farms in Utah. So it's a great crop to grow when you have limited land. It's a luxury item that's bought. And the net returns, so after all of the costs are paid, they, it's really paying off. Um, but it depends on a few things. It depends on your market and knowing that. It depends on the right production, the right crop. Not all crops bring in the same returns. Um, we do a lot of trials here at Utah State. One of the ones that we loved that was so beautiful and romantic were sweet peas, but boy, growing those at high elevation is tough. The sun just, it's just too strong of sun. We don't get long stems. We can still sell them somewhat, but they're way harder to sell than say a peony. Um, so that's one thing to think about as a farmer, especially as you're getting uh, more and more experience with crops and just being ruthless with them. Which, one, which crops aren't paying their bills? Which ones don't earn their real estate? And I wanna talk about some ways to figure that out. Um, and those would be ones to drop off, whereas other ones certainly have really strong returns and those would be the ones to focus on going forward. So per my lessons in econ, there are three main ways to determine pricing. 
um, cost, demand, and competition. And so going through these is really important because today we're covering many different regions. So what we can sell Lysianthus at here in Utah, it might not be the same in Kentucky. Or what, uh, I, or what Heather can sell Lysianthus at in Salt Lake City or Park City, we probably couldn't sell up here in Cache County where it's a bit more rural. So these are the things to really think about and to tailor and to research for your own location. So cost base, more on later. It's what we're going to spend the most time on. Um, but thinking about cost based pricing, this is the idea that there's it costs a certain amount to produce that crop, and you need to make that back uh, in figuring out sales. So to determine the price, easier said than done, right? But adding up the total cost it takes to produce, and we're going to talk a lot about all of the supplies that go into cut flower production. Um, but having having some knowledge of that. Uh, what are you spending to just produce the crop? This includes labor, more on that coming up too. Estimating how many units you'll sell or you have sold. So that could be by the stem, it could be by the bunch, thinking wholesale, it could be by the bouquet. How many are you gonna sell or how many have you sold? Maybe you already have record of that. A lot of people don't have records of these things going in. So don't feel bad if you don't. Um, this is just something to think about going forward. So then what we do is we take the total cost it takes to produce it and we divide it by how many units are being sold that gives us our price per unit if we want to and we're assuming that we're going to make we're going to sell everything that way. Some people might also add a, just a generic markup onto that 10% maybe. So the real benefit of this is that it's bringing a very strong awareness to how much it costs to produce, but the drawback is it's not necessarily tied to consumer demand. What if there's a huge consumer demand and we're just looking at recouping what we uh, paid for? Then that's not the true cost of the item. Uh, and then the other, and so kind of hand in hand with that, it might limit profits. What could the tr true profit actually be? Um, let's see here. So that's cost-based pricing. You're looking at what it costs to produce it, dividing it by the total amount you produced and, um, and going forward from there. The so next is demand-based. And this one's a harder one to assess I think this is a really great one, especially for farmers markets, but um, pricing, the price is set at what the, the consumer values it at. So this is this example where if I'm growing peonies, which are hugely popular here, I know what it costs to produce, but I also know that people are willing to pay a lot more for them. So that, um, and that can take a bit longer to know. It's hard to ask someone what they'll pay. Um, and so some of the ways that our economists have assessed the market or suggested at farmers markets, doing small surveys or having suggestion cards can be very valuable. Finding out what kind of flowers or bouquets they're looking for, finding out what they're comfortable paying, how frequently then at that price point they'd be willing to come back and continue to buy. And the kind of added benefit was with this is that then you can collect their emails to establish lists. And some farmers after doing this actually tend to move away from the farmers market because they have their clientele base. Um, here in Utah, and especially through the Utah Cut Flower Farm Association, I've been amazed at these florist allies that we have who have served on our board um, and they actually share what they're willing to pay. Um, they'll share what their, their wholesale prices are. They'll share what they're looking for. Uh, one of my favorite quotes when we were asking what she wanted from local cut flowers, and she said, the right color and it's not dead, which was so sad and thinking about what the state of wholesale can be. Um, so, so not all florists are willing to do this, and that's very fair, but some are truly allies to this movement. Um, now, this is something that can only be done once, once, once in a while. Um, but one thing that you can do is actually vary your pricing by a little bit uh, for each week um, to see if the number of purchases changes. But you have to be really careful with this. You can make consumers mad if you do this too much. Um, you also have to be really aware of just the market conditions. Don't do this on a rainy day. There's fewer people coming out, um, but these can be ways to check on, on different pricing based on demand. The third method is competition based. Uh, this is one where it comes down to a lot of research, and I think this is a great thing to do. So looking at doing your research to find similar products in a similar market to yours. Social media is a great place to start. I like to look, uh, sorry to the farmers on here, I like to look on social media. I'm always just curious at what pricing is especially because we're not really testing CSAs and farmers markets, subscription type things. And, and a lot of people put that on social media because they're actually advertising on social media. They also use their websites to do the same thing. 
that can be a really nice passive way to go about finding what other pricing is. I think it's worthwhile to look at what it is regionally, what it is nationally, especially if you don't have anything in your area. And then you can kind of uh, you can kind of look up that area and see how how well it associates it compares to yours. Another thing is to visit other farmers markets. So people are much more willing to share information if they are not in competition with you. So, so take a day or, or um, take a day here and there to go to other markets that might be in cities that are similar to yours. So similar uh, type pricing and see what they are, what their products are like, what's their quality like uh, and what's their pricing like. Now, given that, so say you go around, you find all of these different prices, um, the next thing is to consider basing, how do you base your pricing off of theirs? And there's basically three ways we can go. We can go down, we can stay the same, and we can go up. So lower than the competition, there's a big, uh, I should put an underline in a bold and italics, and I got a slide on this coming up here, uh, but be very careful with this. The same price. So if your item is the same quality, it's the same thing, it's not particularly more novel or anything like that, then that could potentially work for you, but you would wanna make sure that it checks out with your input costs, which we're gonna talk a lot on later. So maybe it costs that other person uh, less to produce it. And so they have a lower pricing. Well, that'd be something to check out, or maybe they haven't, they don't know about their input pricing. So they've priced it low and that would not be sustainable. All thing, always be critical, I guess, is what I'm saying in doing the research. Uh, and then a higher price. This can indicate to the consumer that it's higher quality or that it's unique. So considerations with the competition, how much competition is in your area? What, how much competition is in the primary market that you're selling? So are you selling to florists? Are you selling to um, farmers markets? We've got Allie Harrison on here today. And one of the unique things that she did a few years ago was she, her and another farmer realized that they were trying to beat each other. Hopefully I get this story right. But they were trying to beat each other to the florist to sell or not necessarily beat each other, but they were noticing that they were in competition. So they just decided to make a co-op together, whoever, and, and so they would actually sell together. And whoever did the sales got 30% um, of the receipts, the, other, the grower got 70%. And so instead of being in competition, they actually worked together and were able to sell more. Um, what are the competitors like? What is their focus? Are they big or small? Um, so thinking about, are they specializing in a certain cut flower crop? And do they do that so well that you can't possibly compete? Uh, is there something missing in the market? A lot of cut flower farms are relatively small, so it can make sense to go kind of have your own niche with uh, the different crops. Um, and so just some other things to think about. And there were a lot of questions about selling uh, in cities versus rural, and I think we can talk about that a bit in the, the farmer uh, Q&A. So this is my favorite quote from 2019 Ruby Ward. She said, we are not the Walmart of cut flowers at our first cut flower session at the Urban and Small Farms Conference here in Utah. This idea that I, I think getting into cut flowers, a lot of new growers, a lot of new farmers, they're in just this general humbleness to farmers too, uh, in not wanting to charge too much. But truly, truly, truly local farmer, or local uh, cut flowers are a special crop. They are superior to be to what's being brought in in most cases and they shouldn't be uh they shouldn't be priced for um on the low end that you have to make sure you're getting your cost back but they also deserve a lot a lot of credit so these are some of the concerns with underpricing this is one of the main things that we saw uh earlier on coming in is that a lot of the new farmers they wanted to price low to be able to sell and their intent then was to sell for more the next season but what that does is it kind of ruins the customer because they start to associate that lower price with local cut flowers and it really brings kind of everybody down. And I know that there were a lot of questions um, it, from registrants about how do you deal with undercutting? And I hope, and that's something I'd love to spend a bit more time on in the farmer Q&A at the end. So we truly have a, a superior product when we're growing it locally. These are some of the reasons. A couple slides ago, I talked about the reasons florists thought that uh, it's worthwhile to source local cut flowers, that's same for consumers. And so really thinking about long-term business sustainability, if that uh, bouquet is being sold and it's not covering input uh, costs, then that's not a sustainable business. And it's nothing, I don't think there's anything that can really make other farmers matter when they're being undercut purposefully. Um, and again, that really brings down the whole industry, especially long-term. 
So reflections on cost-based pricing. How much did the flowers cost to produce? Things like supplies and labor. What is production like? So some flowers don't grow as well. And what are sales like? So these are the three questions I encourage you to ask yourself. How much does it cost to produce? How much, what's my yield like uh, for this particular cut flower? And what are sales like? So we have done a few enterprise budgets. Um, thanks so much for bringing that up earlier here in the talk. Uh, we, we only have two crops right now, Snapdragon and Peony here at USU. And these are ones that we did our trials. We tracked all the input costs, labor, everything. Um, we sold through that co-op. I was just talking to you about Florage uh, Flower Co-op, which was Allie Harrison and um, Lindy Bankhead here in Cache Valley. They report back on um, the florist preferences. I think I have a little bit here coming up in the next, oh, I just need a circle here. Yeah, so we've got our cut flower budget. So we're trialing cut flowers, we're tracking uh, costs. Sounds like the University of Kentucky is too, which is so excellent. They are a powerhouse in general with tracking pricing, I noticed, from farmers markets to everything else. Um, so we're working on it here at the university level. Um, so we've got these published. We've got for high tunnel production and field production, it really depends on the crop. Uh, for example, peonies are so sought after that our field ended up doing better than our high tunnel with net returns because we had uh, lower input costs with our field. On the other hand, snapdragons here, we just can't get the stem length uh, high enough in the field. We had such better net returns with our high tunnel. So anyway, these two are these two crops are published. We've got three more crops coming this winter. We should have dahlia out this summer and anemone and ranunculus out this winter. So we put those out and freely available. Um, so I want to now walk you through a little bit about cost-based pricing and the information that it requires. I know I'm talking fast. I'm sorry. I'll slow down. I get really excited. Um, so cost-based pricing, it's going to take a bit of record keeping to do it. Uh, and I know that that can be overwhelming at first to consider. Uh, but every piece of information that you record only gets you closer to the bottom line late, uh, later on. So I won't, I won't uh, read through all of these. One of the things that I do, I, I have to be really careful at work. In my personal life, I, I'm an urban homesteader. And I always think I'm going to remember all these details about my, my vegetable crops. And I never do. I always think I've got this mental list of what cultivar is there. But I need to have my notebook with me at all times is what I've decided. And at work, it's mandatory for me as well as my lab um, to be taking notes. So taking notes just helps immensely with remembering things. And also, it can be hard to see trends uh, without having numbers. Numbers just tend, I'm a number person, but truly, they tend to just make things pop out. So. Setting goals, beginning or increasing note taking can be kind of intimidating. There's never enough time in one day. I know, I know that right now it only gets busier and things just become insane. So to think about adding yet another thing on, um, but there's some kind of quick things that we can do during the growing season. And then we can use the winter to really hone in a bit more. Um, so I'm gonna talk about different things to keep track of and different methods for keeping track of those things. So start to kind of, when you're reading or thinking about things, start to reflect on what gets you excited? What makes you dread this and not want to do it? Um, what crops excite you? Because those would be wonderful ones to start with first. And so, the, so this is just thinking about, we're going to start tracking our expenditures. We're going to start tracking how, how well this plant produces and how much of it actually gets sold. So kind of think about these things and whatever gets you most excited and doesn't turn you off, that's where to start. So I like to say maybe start with one crop. That can be a good way to go. I know that sounds impossible when you're doing mixed bouquets. Um, so maybe start with one type of bouquet when you're thinking about it as a group. I think annuals are an easier way to start. Um, perennials take longer to establish. They also, and so we usually um, take those establishment costs and we divide it across a few years. And so that's just an extra step. But annuals, it's that price right up front, tracking the economics and then tracking the yield. So knowing the cost to grow. I put a bunch of questions up here uh, just to get you thinking. And I, I'm, I do have a list coming up in the next slide, but it's it, nowhere near an exhaustive list. But I just wanted to start thinking about, first off, what are the supplies that are needed and being really critical about where those supplies are coming from and whether or not they're truly needed. So what, is, what do you need to purchase to produce the crop and how frequently? So fertilizers, for example, I like to buy in bulk and I don't necessarily use them all in one season because I know that they can last a couple of years. So one thing you can do is just take a Sharpie and write on the bag 
the, the date that you bought it. And that way you can just kind of watch it and see how long it lasts. If it lasts three years, then you would actually take that price and divide it by three years to know what your cost is that year. So writing the purchase date on the item can be really helpful. Uh, is there a less expensive source? Boy, the places that mark things up, they sure invest a lot in marketing and beautiful imagery to make us wanna buy and feel good from, uh, about buying from them, but there might be a less expensive source. Um, especially when thinking about seeds and plugs and tubers, there are some bulk uh, sites that sell in bulk. And I feel like their marketing is from the 80s, the pictures are, but they're selling the same thing as some of these fancier sites are. So those could be a good option to buy from to bring down the input costs. Additionally, if there's growers in your area who are interested, you could potentially go in on an order to get bulk pricing if you don't quite need that quantity um, to help bring down those input costs. Now, as a soil scientist, and I feel bad for the growers on this because they hear me harp about this at least a few times per year. So sorry for the redundancy. Um, I get really annoyed at the marketing that goes around different soil amendments. It seems like they want to sell you everything but the actual nutrients that the crops need. So there's all these feel good things, um, but if you're managing your soil well, you don't actually need to buy a lot to add to it. You need to do a soil test. You need to figure out what uh, nutrients are needed and add just those amount of nutrients and no more. And that's really it. So just kind of thinking through, all right, do I really do I really need this? And that can help bring down some of the pricing, or excuse me, some of the input costs. So these are just some common expenses to consider. Um, I know land is a hard one since a lot of us are just are already doing that on land that we already have, but you usually should account for that in some way. We can talk more later if you're interested, but um, some of these more obvious things like the seeds and the plugs, um, SNPs, miles driven, that needs, all of these things are good uh, to keep in mind. Also thinking again, how often that you are buying them, how many seasons do you get out of them? So this is all recorded. Um, I can also make a little handout here that has the slides. So if you don't have time to write this all down or, and wanted to just know that it, it's already, um, we can supply the handouts. So one of my tips during the season is that you're buying a lot at once, save those receipts. You can stuff them in a folder. You could take a picture of them and then just deal with them in, in winter time when things are too busy. So that you have some, uh, some idea of what each thing costs that year. It also can be really interesting to look at how much things go up. I know there were a lot of questions about inflation. We're feeling it too. Um, but just this idea that you're, there's this list of things you're buying, knowing how much it costs um, and knowing how long it lasts is all very important. And that not everything has to be done all at once. We can take the slow times of the year to really go through expenses, but it's a great first step. Don't forget the labor. So there's a, a very, please, please pay yourself. Make sure you pay yourself. You have to figure out what your hourly rate essentially is. And that can be a really hard thing to do. Um, it can help to go on wherever jobs are posted in your area and jobs that might be of interest to you that are reasonable. Look at what those hourly wages are. And that can be a really nice uh, consideration for what you should be paying yourself. Similarly with your employees here at USU, boy, I had to increase student salaries to be able to have them actually work for me in my lab as opposed to anywhere else um, in our valley because uh, wages have gone up so much. But this idea, you really do need to pay yourself. You need to think about how many hours are being spent on something. Um, and that can be hard to do. So maybe that's something this year to just kind of make a mental note of or have your notebook with you and just write it down. Not necessarily every time, but maybe a week here and there, uh, just jot down how many hours were spent. If kids are helping, their time needs to be considered. They might Their hour of work might not be the same as your hour of work, but it could be a fraction of it. And that's important to consider. Um, and so I like to think about it, and this is how we record it, as how many hours are, are used per task. Um, when you do this, you might find at the end of the season, wow, certain things, 60% of my time was all on this. And that could be really good justification to buy to buy something that'll make that more efficient. So whether that's a tiller instead of turning everything over with a shovel or something to help uh, uh, automate or mechanize the system. So these are things to think about per task. This is also a good way to think about different crops and say, wow, I am spending all this time uh, doing whatever on it. Um, is it gonna pay off in the end? So these are just examples of where the hours can go. 
it can help to make a list and maybe just uh, take a tally every hour you spend on it sometimes. Otherwise, maybe you have it in your head and you don't need it to be that specific. So the second part of this equation, there's three things. First was the input cost. Second is how much you produce. And this is, I admit, this is getting a little bit intense. Um, and so some of you may not find this worthwhile, but I think it can be really helpful, especially in our unique areas to figure out if a crop is worth it because some crops just are less productive than they live up to be per the industry recommendations. So I like to say, define a certain area. Maybe you pick one bed, um, give it a name, give it a number and measure how big it is. How many feet long, how many feet wide and then how many plants did you put in there? Um, because what, what we're gonna end up doing is finding out, well, what's the yield of these plants? And you can figure out how much that area of space is making. You, if for large scale operations, this is probably not uh, so as it's it's possible, but it's maybe not as realistic. So maybe you pick it for your whole farm, and it, you can scale it at different ways. Um, one of the easier things to do is to do it at planting. If you know how many plugs you purchased and put in the ground, make sure you keep note of that. Um, we always do a final count for what established in an area. It's way easier to do it early on than it is in the end when everything grows together. And is a disaster, but this idea that you know how much space is actually farmable, if you know that your space is a, a fourth of an acre, how much of that is actually being farmed though, and that's important to consider too. So some idea of this area that's of interest to you, whether that's a bed, whether it's for the entire farm at once, it's up to, up to you on what you want to hone in on. And then tracking production. So my students have to, have, they have to write down every single stem and they have to measure every single stem. I know that's that is not realistic on an actual farm. Uh, so these are some tips to find out what your yield is like. First is to write down key dates and maybe you just do this for one crop. When did that first start coming in? And, and maybe not pick the day that one stem came in and then you waited a week for another to come in. Start when, when the big harvest season starts, write that date down. When did it end? Maybe that's easy. Maybe it's the first frost date. Um, but that gives you an idea of the length of the season. And then what you can do, and I think a lot of you already know this, is how many times am I harvesting per week? Um, it's up to you on if you want to write down uh, if you want to write down the ones that were marketable versus all of the stems that you were harvesting. But about how many times are you harvesting per week? And then every so often, it doesn't have to be every harvest. It doesn't have to be every week. Just every so often in the season, maybe you pick three times total. Count how many stems you actually harvested. And this is where I mean the marketable or the total number, I think marketable would make the most sense. Maybe if you're typically stuffing a certain number of bundles or bouquets in a bucket, you just line your buckets up and take a picture of that. All right, you just recorded how many stems um, you harvested that time. And then what you can do is say, okay, this many stems in a harvest times this many harvests per week times this long of a season, we just found out what our total yield is. It's not exact, but it's good enough. So tools to quickly write down the information. I love pictures because they come with a date. So here's an example of maybe looking at the buckets. If you know about how many stems or bunches are in there, that's a great time to take a picture. Um, you can also track it with a calendar or a notebook. You can make data sheets for yourself where you've got your bed, Maybe it's just one bed even, you've got your date and you're writing it down. So anything to make it a little bit easier, but I think pictures are an awesome way to go and then you can look at it later on. Um, observations are also really helpful. It's not just about the numbers, but it's also about how it looks, how it sells. Is it worth it to come back to that cultivar? Uh, we did a, a cultivar trial for ranunculus. We just looked at four different cultivars our first year and we decided we just wanted to move with LaBelle and Amidine. Uh, but we took notes about just what we could expect um, from those different cultivars. So that information is also valuable. And that's one that I often think I'm just going to remember. But when there's so many cultivars going at once and so many crops, it's really nice to, to make a note of it. All right, that was rapidly going through um, thinking about yield. And the next, the last thing is how well is it selling? Assess the market, track your sales or stem use. So how many bouquets are you bringing to the farmer's market and how many are you coming home with? Both of those numbers are very important to find out how many are sold and what's not selling. So this could be something where you're just saving receipts. Maybe you take a picture of your 
farmer's market display to see, okay, this is how many uh, bouquets I had that week. Later on, I'm gonna go look at those numbers more carefully, um, but also do counts on how much is going into the compost. That's important too. And what is it that's going into the compost that that's one to maybe dump for next season. Okay, so this idea about tracking about how much is selling. And then when things are slower, this is when you can take a closer look. Okay, so the number of stems that sold divided by the size of that bed, that's going to give you the number of stems per square feet. And if you know how much, uh, or if you had the number, um, the pricing, uh, how much that bed made, you could also find out the, the uh, amount that bed is bringing in. Maybe that's unrealistic to look at it bed by bed, depending on the size of your operation, and you just want to look at it as a whole farm. Um, some of the smaller units, looking at it by bed, that can really help you figure out if certain uh, crops are more profitable. We look at it for cultivar evaluations, if one cultivar does better regionally than the others. The other thing with this is it's not just about the numbers. One cultivar might not be as productive, but boy, does it come in at a key time. It comes in earlier, so it's worth it. Um, these can be great ways to assess the different crops that you're growing. Uh, we also look at this with when we change up our management practices. We were looking at spacing stock, for example, at six inches versus nine inches, and six inches did so much better. We had so many more stems for our unit area, and therefore um, net returns were a lot greater too. So you can look at this in any way you want, any way that makes a difference to you. So to kind of uh, summarize some of this and to tie it together, thinking about what your primary market is, where is your primary market, you really need to do um, some research for your area. And if there isn't any other cut flower farmer in your area, maybe looking at, all right, not in my, my town, but there's this other town over, I know there's a cut flower farm there, how is that going? Um, and that could be somewhat analogous. And maybe you find that you need to, to lower your prices, maybe you can raise them. Um, some people brought up the Boston Terminal Market in their questions, and I wanted to put uh, these links here. Um, maybe we could add them to the chat too. If you Google Boston Terminal Market Ornamentals, it should come up in this text file is what it is for the given day or week. And then uh, Cornell and USDA actually archived the list by date too, so you can go back and look at it too. So I put these two links. Um, by crop, they list the different pricing and it's the pricing uh, by country, sometimes state that it comes from. And then it also is by the grade of the cut flower. And I know a lot of folks are wondering what those grades mean and I do too. Um, we've been able to figure it out for some of the cut flowers. I called the Boston Terminal Market. They actually aren't completely sure on a lot of what the grading stands for. It's just whatever gets reported. It could be a really nice thing to talk to your florist um, about what they're seeing from what when they're buying it from wholesale about how long is that stem and so forth. So it's vague, but it gives you this baseline about what um, the prices is the price is coming in. And um, so some of this is just summary and I know I, I need to move along. So, so the summary of my part here is that I know farming's not easy and I'm asking you to do yet another thing when times are so busy. But if you can do any bit to start doing record keeping, that helps tremendously with input costs uh, and, and how much each unit should be selling for. So if we know what we're spending, we know how much we're producing, that's how we really figure out what the right input, or excuse me, what the right unit cost should be. Um, it's also based on what that, that market is. Uh, so really assessing the market, doing research on the market. We're gonna talk a lot about markets here in the panel um, to put a little bit more of concrete information down. Um, but be critical, be critical of, of everything you buy, but also be critical of what other people are selling things for. If there's one thing to maybe take from this, don't just look at what others are pricing and undercut. That's, that's a really hard thing that can happen in, uh, as a crop is getting established. So these are some, um, a summary of some of the ways to do some record keeping. And with that, I'm gonna wrap up my part of this talk. Um, and the next few slides I have are your questions and I've just grouped them um, by category. So I'd like to open it up to our farmer panelists. And I'd like to have you each give a little bit, um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves to the audience, that would be wonderful. So question to you guys on Zoom, can you see, if I have my uh, slides shared here, can everybody, can you see the people who are talking or should I just unshare so that our pictures get bigger? I'm unsure. Melanie. So we we yeah. can see, but they're little. So it's a okay. little 
um, panes. And I don't know if you were on a phone, maybe you couldn't see the images of the growers. Okay. Um, well, let's start with, I'll, I'll keep my slide up, um, but I'd like for each of the growers to, I'm gonna mute myself for a sec here, so I stop talking. If each of the growers could introduce yourselves, uh, your farm and just a little bit about you, that would be wonderful. So Heather, do you want to start your top on the list on my screen? <laughs> that sounds great. I was actually just going to say, do you want to tell us who, like, which one <laughs> they go? Um, so my name is Heather Griffiths, and I am the president of the Utah Cut Fire Farm Association, and I'm also the farmer of Wasatch Blooms. Um, Wasatch Blooms, I recently moved my farm from Salt Lake County to Cache Valley, but I'm keeping my market in Salt Lake. So I don't know if there was more that you wanted me to share, just for the intro. Okay, thumbs up. I guess I'll go. Um, my name is Fawn Brukert and I am the Utah Cut Flower Farm Association Vice President. So Heather and I work closely together there. I also have a farm called Sago Lily Flower Farm in Salt Lake County. And then I also um, run a cut flower program at a hydroponic farm. Um, we don't grow flowers hydroponically, but we grow plugs for farmers, um, cut flower farmers. So that's kind of what I dabble in. Val, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I'm Val Shermer, and the name of my farm is Three Toads Farm, and we are just outside of Lexington, Kentucky. We've been growing since 1997. And um, we're very small. We're not a large farm. We like to say small batch, like the bourbon. And um, I'm also the president of the Association of Specially Cut Flower Growers. Alexis? Okay, uh, I'm Alexis Sheffield, uh, where our wild roots were located in the bluegrass area of Kentucky, so kind of the central region. Uh, we are on our seventh growing season. We spent five years uh, on a rental property, and then uh, this is our first full growing season uh, here on our own farm. Great. And Allie, tell us about your business. Oh, you need to unmute. Am I there? Yep. Now okay. we've got you. Can you guys see me? I'm terrible at this. <laughs> I don't see a, let me see her. I think I messed something up on my, hold on you guys. Ellie, we, we can, can see, see you, Ellie. Allie. Yeah. You can? Okay. Yeah, oh, perfect. I can't see myself. I don't know what I did. I'm like 87 years old trying to operate a VCR. That's what I feel like right now. <laughs> okay, anyways, we're just going with this. So I'm Allie Harrison. Um, I own Florage Farms, which is a 12 acre cut flower farm in Idaho. And we grow 90 plus varieties of grasses, fillers, flowers, uh, woody branches, all the things. So yeah, it's a pretty big farm. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. So. This part um, is gonna be kind of a free for all. Uh, I've got, I, I'll read off the questions and then however you feel comfortable or want to respond. But the first question is, what are your overall comments and tips for pricing across different markets? And so these are the ones that were mentioned, um, farmers markets and wholesale CSAs and sub, uh, subscribers. Those were the three that came up the most, but there was also a lot about the rest that are listed here. So whatever things that you have found regarding pricing across these different markets. I'll jump in here. Or <laughs> Heather, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, 50% of my gross is retail. Um, but if I, but my wholesale pricing is what I base my retail off of. And so even if you're not doing wholesale, if you're only selling to grocery store or to farmers markets or CSAs, still have a wholesale price because that's how I build my bouquets, knowing what each individual stem is worth wholesale. So my $30 bouquet only has between 12 and 15 stems in it because I know what each one is worth because and the retail price on top of that and my labor on top of that. So
So Heather, I'd like to circle back to you um, and ask, how do you know what to, and I think this is actually another slide, but um, how do you know what to price the different things in a bouquet too, like to keep that note of things? So like you were saying earlier about florists that will share their knowledge with us and be generous with that knowledge. Um, I do have a florist friend who I'll ask her not to tell me other farmers pricing at all, but to tell me what, what's the wholesaler selling things at. And then I'll just kind of gauge from there. But I also do um, the enterprise budgets for my crops. I do my best to do an enterprise budget at least. I'm sure I'm feeling short in some way. But uh, so that gives me an idea of what I need to be making per stem. And so, and then from there I can gauge, okay, if this is, if my anemone is $1.80 a stem, then I need to be selling that for at least $3 retail at least, but really more just to touch. Um, and so my, but I can't sell like, I can't sell a 10 stem bunch of anemones retail for $36. That's not gonna work out. So I, knowing that retail market of how many anemones and how much greenery and maybe a handful of ranunculus in that bouquet. Um, so that helps to that answer that question. Okay. Alexis, were you gonna add on? Yeah, I essentially was just going to echo what Heather said, where I kind of think of it as I sell the flower to myself for my retail stuff. So I sell to a lot of wholesalers. So I'm kind of keeping that price uh, in my mind. And then when I make a CSA bouquet, uh, we, we only did farmer's market for one season, but we do more weddings. And so I almost... I. I'm trying to keep a budget, like have a whole other Excel spreadsheet uh, where I'm selling the flower to myself. And even though I'm not necessarily two different businesses, I almost think of it as a floristry business and a farmer business. Uh, and so I keep that in my mind when I make my counts for my bouquets. Um, and then enterprise budgets are something where we've done really loosely, but we're trying to nail down this year. And I would encourage growers to think about the easiest way to start is with something that has a single stem. So like a single sun stem sunflower or a tulip, right? It's really easy to say, I spent 80 cents on this tulip bulb. I put $200 worth of compost in it and it took me four hours to dig this ditch or whatever it is. And then you get one flower and you know that you're going to sell those for $1.80 wholesale and then you sell them to yourself. And so then you add a markup there. And then as far as markups go, when I'm thinking about retail sales, um, I go back to that sort of, I like classic model of um, a florist is going, a brick and mortar florist is going to charge two to three times what they pay for wholesale. At least that's what I've always been told. And then they're going to add 20 to 30% depending on uh, what their sales outlet is in labor costs. And so I kind of use that as a gauge and that usually gets me at a 60 to 70% growth margin. Um, and, and that's where I want to be that makes my book happy, that makes my husband happy, who does my book. Fawn, <laughs> um, oh, sorry, Val, please. I was gonna say, what Alexis is doing is something I think is really smart, is to figure out, you know, cause so many people, they grow and they also, they design and they're not selling the things to themselves. So I think that that's what you said, Alexis, I think is just really smart and more people should do it. That's such a good way to, to look at it. Um, Fawn, sorry to put, I, I'll stop putting you guys on the spot, but Fawn, I always admire your pricing at farmer's markets. And how did you figure out where to start with that? Um, well, I started too cheap. And I think that helps you figure out that you're not doing something right pretty quickly. So um, there weren't very many flower farmers selling in Utah. Like I couldn't find referencing it's really easy to come in and go oh someone's selling it for 20 that's at least a good starting point um so <clears throat> after two years of selling too cheaply i just realized that my business wasn't sustainable unless i raised my prices um and i've done some like everyone said loose enterprise budgets um counted stems and things like that but i think knowing like if I had to go and buy my flowers from the wholesaler and replace what I've grown helps you have a, a perspective of, you know, I've dabbled in wedding work. And so if I knew I had to go and buy something, if I had a crop failure on something and this is going to cost $18 a bunch, 
it helps you price appropriately because you know you're going to be subsidizing someone's wedding if you're not charging enough. And then the other thought I had too is at farmer's markets, um, people aren't going to come up and be like, is that a scoop scabiosa? Like that's stunning. And mm -hmm. so for me, I know that I have to um, rein myself in a little bit with some of those expensive flowers because at a farmer's market, people just want something beautiful on their table. They want something bright and cheerful, but they're not looking for Japanese lisianthus that are going to be, you know, remarkable. So I, you know, keeping my costs down lower helps me have a sustainable um, markup at the farmer's market. Um, circling back to Alexis, there was a, qu a question of clarification, and I think to Fawn too, but what do you mean sell to yourself? Question in the chat. Yeah, um, Fawn brought up a like, good point, like thinking about, because we do weddings, but also if you were going to go buy this to be a brick and mortar, mortar type floors, what you would buy that from something, so somebody for a wholesale price. So I think of it as either I'm going to go sell this to a florist um, as a wholesale, or I'm going to sell it to Wild Roots florist, the, far, the florist part of my farmer florist model. And so the farmer Alexis sells to the florist Alexis. And so I think about, well, I would sell this to a florist for $1.80. So um, the florist part of my business buys it. I don't put that like officially. I'm working on doing that more officially, but I buy it. And so I know that if I was a normal florist, I would be marking that up from a dollar eighty to two to three times that and putting that in a bouquet. So that's kind of I don't know if that makes sense, but I like theoretically buy it from myself um, and think about what that markup needs to be in order to make a $15 bouquet or a $30 bouquet. Thanks so much. Ellie, I don't know if you're still there. I am calling people out apparently. I didn't stop. Hey, you there. I hey -oh. it out, you guys. I see myself <laughs> out. Um, I was just eating a Costco uh, rotisserie chicken over the sink, but I'm back. <laughs> We're keeping it real here. Um, so I wanted okay. to ask yes. I wanted to ask you because you brought this up at the Urban and Small Farms Conference, but you had this really cool idea with pop-up shops. Um, where you're setting it up in a store. Yes. So can you share about that? And then also, how do you figure out pricing for that? Yes. And okay, I'll compete? start with pricing. Um, so okay. how we figured out pricing is I literally just ask my florists, like, what are you guys paying right now for other local flowers? What are you paying wholesale? And we kind of get like, find something in, in between. So, and they'll, I just ask them everything. That's, that's how I've learned everything. I will just ask my florist, I'll email them, I'll talk to them, I show up in their shops and I'm just like, what are you guys paying? What are you paying right now wholesale? What are you paying to ship this stuff in? What are you paying for shipping? You know, what are you, you're getting stuff from other local growers, what are you paying from them? And we just kind of meet in the middle and I just really try to match what other people are charging. That's my strategy. I don't, you know, we have all, all the records like you talked about, but they won't, your florists aren't gonna pay beyond what they're already paying you know what I mean and if there's something that that's it's that expensive to grow we don't grow it you know if it's like oh well, I have to charge 30 40 dollars a bunch because it costs so much money to grow it's goodbye like we just we won't grow it you know what I mean um so that's kind of my strategy it's just like I just always encourage farmers to talk to your florists ask them you know and they'll and because it fluctuates and it just changes and this year everyone's prices went up because labor went up and gas is outrageous and there's like surcharges now and we're charging a delivery fee because gas is so high because we've got the diesel truck and so we're paying five something a gallon for diesel right now in utah so those are other ways like if if you don't want to raise your prices then charge that delivery fee because so far the florists have had no problems paying that so I just, that's kind of, that's not my only strategy, but that's one way that I've really tried. I just try to match. I don't want to undercut and I just want to be somewhere in the middle of what they're used to paying. And that's what I found sell, like, that's how we sell the most flowers is if we can kind of just find this happy medium. So um, yeah. And then another thing that we did this, this past season, we haven't started up yet because we're still super early in our season in Utah and Idaho, but we, we launched those flower stands. 
So um, is that, that was your question, right? Melanie was like talking yeah, about the yeah. flower stands. So we, I bought all of these really cool flower stands from a craft store that was going out of business in Idaho Falls. And there's like the dried, like the stands that you would put dried flowers in at like Hobby Lobby or whatever it was like. It was just a random craft store that went out of business. It wasn't Hobby Lobby, but think of that. And we bought, I bought all these little buckets and put them in. It was such a cute, it was on wheels. And we just wheeled them into a couple of stores in Cache Valley. And it was a way for us to get rid of um, and anything that came off the route that was like old or didn't sell or maybe a weird color, we would just drive it and dump it off at the stand. And it was just, it was awesome. It was, it was a great way to get rid of extra flowers. Uh, we charged like 20 bucks a bunch or whatever. So it was, I was actually making more money because it was just a straight 20 bucks a bunch, whatever I put in there. And we put up a big Venmo sign that was just like Venmo Florage. And it was just on your honor system. And we made a couple hundred bucks every week doing that. Bunches, just to put perspective on the 20 bucks. It was just like, or whatever it was. We would sometimes do um, like mixed bunches if I had time or if I had one of my helpers make up some just random bunches from stray flowers or extra flowers. But yeah, so it would just be whatever we had left. So, and it was just, 20 bucks is what we charged and because nor like those bunches would have gone to the florist for like eight to eight to 18 or whatever you know so at 20 bucks i felt like that was a good price point that kind of matched what other growers were selling locally for their bouquets and their bunches and yeah it was just it was an excellent way to get rid of stuff that wasn't going to sell anyways thank you thank you all for your uh comments on these different markets. Um, if anybody has any questions too or wants any follow-up, please feel free to write your question in the chat. So I'm going to skip to our next question. Um, a big question was about changes in pricing for the same product. So if anyone here is has been selling in a smaller town and then they also sell in a city, uh, what's that markup like? Uh, there was a specific question that I thought was really interesting and it seems similar across states that there can be counties where the residents have a lower income, but then there's this amazing tourist season. And how do what do you what do you do in that situation? Um, and then also just the time of year. Are there any times to discount? Uh, how do you do by grade? Things like that. So, so farmers anywhere you'd like to answer, please feel free. Can I say something about discounting? Yes. I never discount. I don't discount ever, ever. Um, people come up at the end of the market and if I have a couple bouquets left over, they'll ask me for a discount and I'll tell them no. And this was especially hard in my first couple seasons um, because sometimes I'd have a lot of bouquets left, but I did not want to train my customers to expect a discount at the end of the market. And so um, the same thing with like my CSA. I've priced it pretty fairly. I'm not very expensive. I could probably raise my prices. So I'm not going to discount them so that people know, oh, I'm just gonna wait till wait, right before Mother's Day because she always discounts them. I'm with you, Fawn. We never ever discounted at the farmer's market. It's, I think, I think it's a dangerous thing to get into as well. Okay, so not in a in a day. What about seasonally? Do prices change? We grow in a hoop house at, um, for the for the first year, but we've done low tunnels in the past, and so we get things earlier than other other growers, and they're just higher quality uh, when they're early. So we definitely have like our ranunculus is a good example of those first stems, right? They're chunky, the fat, and you're like, yes, this is cream of the crop. Um, but also they like took more to grow. Like I'm scooping snow off of a high tunnel uh, in the middle of winter. And so I'm going to charge more for those than the weaker stems that are come later or singles. They're still beautiful, uh, but I know that they're not, um, not as great. So I definitely will change the price a little bit. Um, and when I say price, I say wholesale because I base all of everything I sell off of what my wholesale price would be. Uh, and so I, I will alter product. Like when everybody's got tomatoes, tomatoes are not as expensive, but the people who have tomatoes earlier in the season get a higher price point. It's the exact same thing for flowers. Uh, and usually the first cuts are um, higher quality. And so it's kind of like a second 
like you have your seconds and they're going to be lower in price at least that's the way i've done it i agree with me what, what what everyone has said about uh discounting and then selling by grade as well and one thing i also don't offer discounts but what i do is at the beginning of every season try and find a place where i would want to donate flowers to so a local hospital or nursing home or um, an establishment that I want to donate my flowers to and try and change it every year. So that, that way, when I have flowers that don't sell or I have more a larger harvest that week, it has a place to go and I can feel morally good about it. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. Um, we had a, a nonprofit startup called Brightening Blooms as one example, and they, they started by bringing bouquets to nursing homes and then they started just bringing them by the stem so that uh, senior citizens could actually make their own and they could learn the flower type. So it was a really great tool for working on memory too. So it's amazing to think of the second life that flowers can have. Um, one thing that we noticed in selling, so we were we had a peony trial for many years um, where we were using high tunnels and other things to try to advance production. And so, and what we found is that, uh, well, thanks to Allie and another farmer, Lindy, for selling them, uh, Flora, they were all purchased by pre-order. And uh, what that told the economists is that we had priced them too low if everything sold out. And we're talking, we graded them too. So all, all of the, um, the best grades, as well as our calls, we sold those at a discount. And, and we actually increased price, they, they worked with me. <laughs> but we increased prices every year to try to figure out what is the true price of a peony and so last year I wanted to go up to $7 a stem. We ended up going up $6 a stem for anything ready before Mother's Day. And I think the florists maybe were a little taken aback, but what I was really impressed with is they just wanted to know why. So we brought up, well, we're growing them in a high tunnel. We have to vent. We start the season in February as opposed to May. And um, when we explained why the price was higher, they were very, they still, they were very willing to buy still. And so a lot of times it's just that explaining um, makes all the difference. Well, and Melanie, do you remember um, that Lindy had a harder time selling the peonies in Cash Valley because Cash mm -hmm. Valley is cheaper, but I sold all of them at $6, the stem or whatever, yeah. um, no problem to Sun Valley and I, Sun Valley and Jackson because they're higher end markets. So it was like two different markets that we kind of experimented in and like they, they had no problem in Jackson Hole and Sun Valley, but then in Cash Valley, which is like a, it's a smaller town, just like what you're saying, you know, small town versus the city. That's exactly what happened. You know, yeah. that was our experience anyways. Mm -hmm. So it was a good dollar difference between Cash yeah. Valley versus our more urban hubs. So yeah. Jackson Hole, she's referring to in Sun Valley, Salt Lake, those Park City, those markets um, go for a bit more. Let's see. I know we're, oh, we have so much to talk about. Okay uh thoughts on social media for marketing and sales best flat platforms what are your thoughts on social media who's on social so media I, yeah <laughs> uh i have seen i have two very distinctive i have my instagram and my facebook right my instagram feeds right into my facebook so everything the posts are exactly the same at the exact same time my wedding clients come from instagram my weekly sales, my CSA sales, for the most part, come from Facebook. So uh, at least in at least in Kentucky, um, you know, and we're you know we have rural areas. So uh, I would play on that, like if wherever you're located at. And I think I've heard that from a lot of other growers is their more weekly sales are um, are coming from Facebook, and then their like wedding or high end design where design is coming from Instagram. I don't know if anybody else has experienced that or not. I don't know if it's just the way the platform is set up, but I, I ask on all my wedding questionnaires, like, how do you find us? And it's 99% of the time it's Instagram and, or just, you know, like another client referral. So I have seen a huge difference. Like people will message me on Facebook about buying a bouquet, but they don't message me on Instagram about buying a bouquet. So that's what I've seen. I would agree with Alexis. Like I find Facebook, they're more my CSA people. And there's a lot of people following me on Instagram, but it's a different kind of clientele. Some of them are just other farmers, get a lot of other farmers following you on Instagram. Um, but one of my thoughts is I sell the most when I reach out to my email marketing lists. 
And so if I have like CSAs to sell and they just haven't been selling because I've been posting them on social media, I need to make an email to the people that have already said, hey, I want your stuff. They've kind of already committed to like buying from me. And then I hope, well, maybe I'll come back to this. I'm going to agree with Fawn on the email list. Like my Instagram has just plummeted. They've changed the algorithm and all the engagement has just fallen and I hate it. Um, but my email list, I can send out an email and make a good handful of sales for my CSA um, in February. And that's great. And that helps. So um, I use my Instagram only as a way to connect and I don't make sales on Instagram. I say it as a way to connect to my customer and to people, and then to encourage them to sign up for my email. And then email is where I make my sales, but it's also where I can be more heartfelt, um, whereas Instagram and all of that is very short and snippet and people want to be entertained. They don't want to be thinking about it, but email can be a little more mindful with it. Any other comments on social media? All right. Um, Okay, I'm trying to think of how to talk about this, but I guess it's thinking about, oh, excuse me. Um, how do you determine the size of a bouquet? Uh, if you're selling wholesale, how do you know how many stems go in a bunch? So kind of sizing and how do you determine the price of a bouquet since everything's mixed? Same with fillers. We've talked a little bit about this, but if you'd like to elaborate at all, um, maybe the last bullet point we can just say if something's kind of common out there. I feel like zinnia. <laughs> Or just how do you price something that's common? And then all of the other specific questions. I think having an idea of what the price, what it takes to produce each stem. You know, a peony has taken three years just to produce like a, a cut, right? So you're not going to fill your bouquet with peonies. You're going to have a mix of lower end and higher end stems. And having knowing your inputs are going to help you understand how to price a bouquet and how many stems to put in. If you want your price point to be $20 because that you feel like that's a good price for your market, that doesn't <clears throat> Sorry, that doesn't mean you have 20 stems. That means you might have 12, especially at the beginning of a season where you have peonies and ranunculus that are higher end. And then maybe later in the season, um, like in August, where I have a lot of zinnias and basil, things that are cheaper to produce, my stems might be 14, or my, my bouquets might be 14 stems instead of 12. Going off of what Fawn said, that's another reason why I like retail is because, so with pricing, I try to not know what other farmers are pricing at uh, because I don't want to, I, I need to make what I need to make for my flowers, for my farm to be sustainable. And so if I'm like, if I'm overpricing it a little bit lower or they're a little higher, that's gonna make me insecure. So I try and just focus on what I need. And with that pricing in mind, if I have, a, if I have more zinnias, and I, maybe I can stuff with or some lower end, um, lower pricing flowers. I can stuff those into a bouquet and have it be a bigger bouquet. Uh, whereas if I have a the xanthus that's got too many flowers on it, I need to make that smaller and really equal that out. Um, so that's how I, I size my bouquets is by the my wholesale pricing that I need for my business. And then I scale it up, put in my labor and my retail pricing on top of the wholesale. And then for my wholesale bunches, um, if I'm doing it to florists, I usually do 10 stem bunches. If I do it for grocery stores, I'm, grocery stores gets the same wholesale pricing as my florist. So they get five stem bunches because they can't sell a 10 stems of daffodils for $30. So. Well, we base everything. We don't do a lot of bouquets anymore. Most of ours are just straight bunches. And we just base everything off kind of a 10 stem bunch but I always try to teach my harvesters um, that it's more value versus 10 exact stems. Because again, like you guys were talking about early in the season, um, your renunks are like a lot smaller, right? Until they really get going. And so 10 little tiny renunks versus 10 big renunks yeah, at the same price, do you know what I mean? So when our renunks are quite a bit smaller, we'll do 15 to 20. 
And then as they get going, as they get bigger, then it's back to 10 nice luscious stems. So I always try to teach people it's more of a value than an actual literal 10 stems sometimes, if that makes sense. You know, I don't know. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. Allie, you taught my students too about holding the bouquet in your hand to determine if it's it should be yes. around five or around 10 because some of those stems yep. are a lot bigger. That was yes. really helpful. Totally. Yeah, so that's one thing I always try to teach new farmers too, because they're very, if you don't have a lot of experience, you're thinking 10 literal stems. And your 10 stems that you're growing in your farm might be really little compared to another grower. You know, so put 20 in there. And, and as it gets going, they'll get bigger. And as you get to be a better grower, you'll get bigger, prettier flowers too, you know? I think I saw, I think, I think it was Muddy Acres Flower Farm. I saw it on, um, don't quote me on that, but they said, you're not always your customer. And I thought that was a hit me because sometimes I make a bouquet and I do the math and the math is like, I'm like, this is what this looks like. And, and you also taking it into like what Allie said of like, you know, the size of the bunch or something. But, um, you know, I, I kind of work backwards. I say I have, I'm going to make a $20 bouquet and then I work backwards on looking at what my wholesale prices and my labor prices. Um, and sometimes I get a bouquet and I'm like, that's it? That's all? Like somebody's going to pay $20 for that? And uh, I have to sometimes remember that I am not always my customer. So um, follow the math uh, and don't remember it's a business and, and maybe try to take a little bit of emotion out of it, which I know is hard because we grow beautiful things and it's easy to get just lost in that. But try to take some of the emotion out of it and remember you're running a business, even if you're running a business that's like three raised beds or you're running a business that's 12 acres, it's a business. And that is what um, I think all of us need to remember as far as pricing goes so that we all can kind of help each other. Like uh, Val said one time, like rising tide floats all boats. Well, it only does if we're all kind of considering that we are a business and not just I'm selling flowers out of my backyard. Uh, so, um, any other comments on for this set of questions? I just think going off Alexis, don't ask your friends or your family that are really cheap either. Like, what would you pay for this? Because you're going to get terrible, terrible feedback. That's all. I agree with you a thousand percent. I mean, when we are not, we have not been at the farmer's market for several years, uh, but we always had two size bouquets. We had like an $18 one and a $35 one. And then we always had one or two that were extraordinary and that somebody would want to pay $55 for. But it seems to me that the most important thing you can do is to build your brand. And we were specialty cut flower growers. And so to build it on stuff that is beautiful for people. And I think what Fawn might have said was that when you're not you know, you're, you're not, when you're learning to grow, your bouquets or your flowers are going to be smaller. So just make it bigger because go for the price point that you want to get to and just make it so that when somebody buys that from you, um, they'll, they'll be, they'll be happy. Um, and they'll come back and they'll pay $25. I'll pay, you know, whatever it is, they'll pay some great ones and don't be that low person because it's so hard to raise your prices. Um, and I think brand just is, is so important. Uh, when we started off, we were, we sold, we were, we, we, we created a reputation based on Oriental, Oriental lilies, which, um, uh, and I, so I went to the, um, to a florist and they were selling them at the time for $6. And I thought ours are every bit that good. And so it was so scary to start off with $6 at the market, but then we ended up at eight to $9 a stem at the market. So people will pay for something extraordinary that is presented well, and your merchandising is great. They know who they're buying from. Um, I just had to throw that out there. Well, I love these perspectives so much that 
in thinking about how a customer is going to remember what they paid for that bouquet, but they might not remember everything that's in it. And so that you're adjusting the bouquet itself, not the price later on as you gain experience. That's brilliant. That's a wonderful takeaway. Um, I did need to circle back because someone asked if there were any good ideas on how to collect emails in the first place. So farmer's market's a great place to start, but are there other ways to collect emails? So I have experience with this. Um, we put a mailing list click thing on our um, website, join our mailing list. That's like the easiest, quickest way to start an email campaign. Um, and then just put it all over your Instagram, put it on your contact page. But that's how we started really seeing our email list grow was when it was like, join our mailing list right on the front pop-up of your website. That's the easiest, fastest way to grow that list. Oh, okay. Uh, and then could anyone touch specifically on greenery and filler from this list? How do you price that stuff? Um, greenery is not cheap. Greenery is also a flower, right? Like you're growing a stem of greenery, just like you're growing a stem. And like, to me, sometimes greenery is worse because you have, you can't strip all of it, right? Like when you grow a flower, you can strip all the greenery that looks like crap. You can't strip that with greenery. That's the whole point. Um, so make sure that you're pricing appropriately. It's not, it's not cheaper. Um, it makes the bouquet look bigger too. So, you know, if you've got five zinnias and you add three stems of greenery, you went from a $15 bouquet to a $20 bouquet or something. So um, you should be doing, thinking of those just like you would any true bloom crop. And then if you are picking weeds, which guilty and not ashamed of it, uh, you are putting in labor to pick those weeds uh, and you're finding them and you're processing them and you're doing that. So what is your labor price? Like mine is a minimum of $20 an hour. And so, um, because there is not unskilled labor in farming, uh, it, it takes skill to know when to harvest, what to do with it, uh, how to use it. So there's value in what you do. Don't forget that. I was gonna say a lot of my favorite, like Atroplex is a weed here in Utah. Pig's weed is in the amaranth family. Like they're weeds. Um, but they do well. And when people ask me, how do I know what to grow? What can I grow? And I tell them to look at what they weeds they have in their yard, you know, look at what's already growing and thriving and find the cultivated variety of it. Um, but like she said, it's totally there. It's labor and they're, they're not going out and picking the atroplex off the side of the road, but I'm picking it off of my farm. So they're going to pay for my labor and my labor and my greenery are good. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I think. Oh, oh, go ahead, Allie. Oh no, I was just gonna say we the way that we price our greens is that we have two different ways that we cut our greens, and one way is we call we, what we call a bunch cut. It's how we cut cress, some atroplex, um, some of the amaranth, where you just take the bunch in your hand and cut it. Or versus greens like our berry foliage, which is stem by stem and then bunching. And, and so our labor is twice as much on like the blackberry foliage versus bunch cutting cress or some thick green in a row that we just hack down, band, and throw into a bucket very quickly. So that's another way to think about your pricing if you're bunch cutting it quickly or if you're actually having to cut it stem by stem. And I was just gonna say, I think one of the things that we should all do is to remove the word filler from our vocabulary because it's, we call it foliages. And it's, because like everybody said, we spend as much time and effort on growing great foliages or harvesting bunch cut foliages as we do on the florals. And so um, we always sold hydrangea foliage for as much as we sold hydrangeas for, surprisingly. But uh, don't, don't let people think filler. Filler sounds so, cheap and nothing we do is i mean some of it costs us less but it still goes into making something beautiful for people that's beautiful <laughs> okay let's talk inflation i think we have touched on this a little bit um but what are you all seeing with inflation this year and how are you handling it there's a lot of anxiety out there about selling this year having to raise prices do you raise prices? 
So we are the, the way that we did it was um, we raised our prices slightly, and then we also um, started paying our harvesters per bunch cut. This was a total game changer. So we used to pay last year all of our harvesters hourly. And it was kind of frustrating because you'll have one harvester that'll just like, you know, they might do 10 bunches an hour, but then you've got this other harvester that'll do 50 and they're making the same amount. So we did our pricing this year based on like the strawberry growers in Washington and apple pickers and stuff where you're getting paid per bunch. So it's incentivizing my harvesters to pick a lot more and it has completely changed. So we pay a base rate, an hourly rate that's like minimum wage. And then anything that they cut above and beyond that, we're, we mark it all down and they get paid, you know, 50 cents a bunch. So even 75 cents, I'm paying 75 cents a bunch right now um, for tulips. And, and I set the standard. So for example, I can pick 50 bunches in an hour of tulips. That's 38 bucks. That's 38 bucks an hour, you know? So that completely has changed the way that we have structured our wages this year. And it's incentivized our harvesters and it's, it's been amazing. Cause it's like, the more you pick, the more you make, the more we make. <laughs> so, it, and I didn't know if it was gonna work. This is kind of an experiment and it's totally worked and we loved it. So I've actually shortened my CSA season. I've kept my price the same. Um, whereas for delivery for 12 weeks last year was 444. Um, but delivery for 11 weeks this year is still 444. So instead of being $28 a bouquet, it's $30.50 plus the $10 charge for uh, delivery or $10.50 for delivery. So I've sh I shortened my season, um, but I am also feeling that crunch of like, so I'm, um, I just bought my new farm. I moved farms from Salt Lake County to Cash Valley and I am keeping track of everything to a much more degree than I've ever done before. Um, and so seeing that like, I just bought a delivery truck. <laughs> um, and, and that price and like, how am I budgeting? How am I going to pay for, make those payments and pay the insurance and pay for my uh, employees and all, all of these costs. And then, and then, okay. And then I also need to pay myself and I need to have a, I'm gonna goal of 8% profit margin. Um, after all of this, this is how much I need to make. How many reasonable bouquets can I produce in one season or one week? And then what can I charge for those bouquets, so. Excellent. All right, just because of time, let's move on. I think we covered that really well. Um, I think we've covered part of this. Uh, questions, there were questions from new farmers about if they should price things lower than established farms. How do you gracefully increase prices? I loved that that word was in there. Um, and how do you deal with competition undercutting you? How do you educate consumers? So take it from there. I think we should focus on undercutting and um, especially ed educating consumers and just this, yeah, how bad it is undercut. R rant on that for a little bit. So I have recent experience um, with a, a market uh, and I, I have to start by saying it is not like a vicious thing. Like it is not someone selling, well, they're selling them for 20, so I'm going to sell mine for 18. It is strictly a they don't see value in what they do. Uh, and also they just want to make people happy. You know what I mean? Like everybody has that. Like, I just want people to, I want to share my flowers with people. Um, and I think I see this a lot with people who are doing it more for fun or are retired. And they, they're not thinking about their labor, I think is what it is. Like they're pricing things um, cheaper than wholesale normally. And that's like, you know, they're making bouquets. Uh, or they're selling by the stem and they're like, well, we just do this for fun. Uh, and sometimes you just have to have kind of an honest conversation with, well, I have to make money on it. And it can be in a nice way. Like your flowers are beautiful. Um, you know, and if you want to make people happy, donate them to a nursing home or to Meals on Wheels. But you, uh, you selling yours low hurts me trying to make a profit uh, and not just a profit, but make a living. And usually I think that people, when you put it to them that way, um, they're more willing to um, not undercut you because they didn't really think they were undercutting to begin with. They were like, oh, just, I don't, I don't charge for, you know, going out and cutting stuff. Um, and then as far as undercutting, like for a wholesale uh, point of view, my experience has been, they just don't know. And so sometimes just 
you know, reaching out and being like, hey, you're so totally t- selling yourself short. Like your ranunculus are beautiful. You should be selling those for 250 a stem. That's what I'm doing. And my floors eat it up. And they're like, what? Like, and they can't believe that they've been missing out and selling them for, you know, a dollar fifty or something. And so um sometimes that works. And then sometimes I'm like, hey, I'll buy all your ranunculus for a dollar fifty if you're gonna sell them to that. And then they very quickly change their price. <laughs> Love it. Anything else to add? I have a story. I have a story about underpricing too. Um, so I have a florist. She likes to buy mixed bouquets for me. She has a shop. She puts them out. She they're her farmer bunches, right? She initially was getting them from ten dollars a bunch from another farmer who stopped selling them to her. I sold them to her for seventeen dollars a bunch. And one time she tried to make her own mixed bouquets. She's like, because my pricing was a little too high. She wasn't sure about it. So she tried to make her own and realized it was really hard for her. She has a full staff and they didn't like doing it and they didn't feel comfortable doing it and they continued to buy mine. Um, so they continued to buy my $17 mixed bouquet bunches. This is like $17 is my wholesale cost for mixed bouquets. Um, and, then, and then, so they continued to buy mine and I still have, and then that's my story. She tried to undercut my own pricing um, and realized she didn't want to do it. And so I continued that route. And we also have a really good relationship. Um, but when someone is selling for a super low price because it's fun and it's something to do, they're not going to last too long. They're going to be burnt out at some point because I'm we're, I'm almost burnt out and I'm trying to do something with it. You know, I'm trying to get paid. Um, but so I don't stress about it. They're not going to be around very long. And I can focus, my motto this year is focus on my own farm. Don't look at what other people are doing. Focus on what I need to do. And if someone else is doing something and it's cutting in on my business, maybe I need to, maybe that's an opportunity for me to reimagine that, how that's hurting me and what I can do differently. But I'm not going to be focused on what they're doing at all. Someone said amen. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I think um, if you have a quality product and you yourself are kind and friendly, then you really don't need to worry about what other people are doing. And I think there is something to be said about being so cheap that people think there's something wrong with your flowers. Um, Occasionally you'll see a new flower farmer come in. And I remember years ago, someone was trying to sell like a CSA for like five dollars a week and no one was buying and it was like well people don't expect to get anything for five dollars and so they're not excited to buy a product that's so discounted that they're wondering what's wrong with it so well said thank you all um Real quick, what's the best way to educate consumers on local flowers? How do we help people know how important it is to support local farms on this crop too? Join your local organization. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Join your local organization. Join, find the people that are promoting your local flowers in your area or local farms in your area and become a part of it, join. (laughs) I think it kind of depends on your consumer. Like, are you educating your customers at a farmer's market or are you educating your florists? So like figure out your, like what you're educating them on kind of first. Um, And I don't know, I feel like the florists educate me (laughs) more than I educate them. That's, so I start there. Like, and I really, again, I, I will just preach this from the heavens that if you're selling to florists, just ask them everything. Like I, I, I never want to go into a floral shop telling them what my prices are and telling them. It's like, no, tell me what you're, who you're buying from, where are you getting your stuff from? What are you paying? And that's, so that just that strategy has helped me a ton instead of me approaching it. Like, this is what I'm doing and this is what I'm selling it for. You know, I, I first glean all that information off of them. And then that helps me build my price list, figure out who I want to sell to, what their business is like. You know what I mean? That's kind of what I've been doing. Do you feel like, uh, someone in the chat, do you feel like you need to educate the florists on um, 
why they should be buying local, what the difference is from your stuff versus wholesale, or do you feel like you open your truck and they see what the difference yeah. is? Yeah, no, I think the product totally sells itself. And if they're ever unsure, I just give them a bunch of stuff for free. I'm like, try it, test it out, see how it goes, base life test it, you know? So that, that is a way that I can sell a lot more is if they're unsure, if they're like, mm, I don't know, I'm like, take it, take a bunch, test it out, let me know. And they always come back and they're like, holy smokes, this is amazing. This lasted three weeks in my cooler. This lasted X amount of days. This is so much better than anything I got. So I encourage farmers to do that also. You don't have to give a full bunch away, give a couple stems away and encourage them to base test it and then tell them, say, give me your feedback. Tell me what you thought. Did it hold up? How did it do in the sunlight? How did it do, how did it do in your bridal bouquet? You know, just, and they, they will educate you so much more than, than I think farmers going in and telling them how their flowers are going to change their lives. Let the florists experience it for themselves. Lovely. Okay. We are having a lot of flower talk and I love it. So I'm going to, I think we just have a couple more slides of questions. So maybe like one or two more. So we'll just kind of move through. I think we've covered a lot of this. Um, there was they were there were some questions about what flowers are high end cut flowers, what fl flowers are low end cut flowers, what's your most profitable cut flower type, um, is there a formula for pricing a bouquet? Any any direction you want to take this set of questions would be great. Oh, and this is, for the record, our last slide of questions. So everyone made it. No, I would include uh, on high-end cuts. I would also include um, dahlias and peonies. And on the lisianthus, somebody was talking about earlier, the Japanese ones. I mean, they're phenomenal. I mean, I think they're, they are just amazing. And what we've done with our florists too, is that, you know, a lot of times the little, the tips that you might be cutting off, they'll pay um, $8 a bunch for those. And also um, event people. I think something is only like prof like profitable or high end if you can sell it. Um, and I say that because I grew some really beautiful Lysianthus one year and I didn't have the best market for it, or I, it was really the first year I had very success with it and I just wasn't expecting and I had a hard time selling it. And even though they're beautiful, people loved them, but I had to charge a lot because they're an expensive, difficult flower to grow. And so it wasn't my most profitable. And I kind of, even though it's high end, it wasn't high end for me. Um, versus I can grow uh, a zinnia and grow it really cheap and sell it for, you know, sell it for cheap, quote unquote. Um, and, but I, it's, I can make more off of it. And so I think that's where those economic budgets come in. I'm really trying to nail down the dahlias because, I mean, I use them for events, but do I really need 200 of them to sell wholesale if it takes me way too many hours to process them and to plant them and to do all of that? So um, there's no shame in growing something that's considered less high end, as long as you're making money off of it. Like that's, that's what we're all here to do, right? Is to create a beautiful world, help the environment, but also we got to make money. So if you're making money off of Cosmos, you don't need to grow dahlias if you're not going to make money off of them. So, um, it's very really easy to get sucked into the beauty and like Florette has like I love Florette, but like they preach all these beautiful things and you want to do all of them, but you don't, you don't have to, and you're still a flower farmer. So try not to get sucked in. That's where those economic budgets can really help you out. I totally agree with that. I try to have like one really nice local flower in my mixed bouquets, like a Lysianthus or a nice Dahlia. And then everything else is, is almost hundred percent direct. sow. whatever I can direct. sow and take out some labor for myself, I'm going to do that. Um, so almost the rest of my bouquet is like, well, I mean, I charge my, my minimum for the most part is like 90 cents a stem for wholesale, but most everything is around a dollar to a dollar uh, 20 a stem. Um, and so even like Snapdragon and Utah are kind of like high end to get those really nice Snapdragons. But, uh, so just, if I have one good focal flower, then everything else can be supporting flowers. That's what they are. They're supporting flowers. They're to, there to show off the main character. 
specifically said. Any other comments on this last set of questions? And are there any other questions out there in the audience that you'd like to send in through the chat? We'll give it a minute here. Um, in the meantime, I let's see here. I have my contact information up here. Oh, someone has advice on starting a co-op. Am I? I don't know. If so, oh, great, Alexa. Yeah, if, if, you, if Utah, if we're, Kentucky has just started one, so it's still um, the year of figuring things out. So if somebody has more experience, please go ahead. I don't have experience starting a co-op, but we have two new ones here in Utah, and I think it's awesome that they've started it. Um, Molly Payne is one. She's in the chats right now, and she said, check out Rooted Farmers. I think that's good advice. I think, too, when Heather and I um, and the rest of our board started our association, that was kind of one of the things we hoped would happen eventually. And so networking with people and not being afraid to approach other farmers because your competition, like think cooperatively and just reach out and, and establish connections and um, relationships is really important. Um, I, I know that being part of our Utah Cutflower Farm Association has helped start both those co-ops a lot of the farmers met at events and um going to places and and just don't be afraid to approach people yeah i had a co-op well it was a co-op it was very informal it was lindy and i for a couple years and we st i still take on other growers flowers the a good rule of thumb is a 70 30 split and just sell each other's flowers. That's all a co-op needs to be. Like there's start with that. Like I'll take your flowers, you take mine, you go this way, I'll go that way. Everybody wins. And a co-op can be just that simple. It doesn't have to be a complicated structured thing. You know, just, I, I my advice would be just to start simple and just see 70, 30 split is kind of the industry standard. So the, that, that means that the grower gets 70% and the seller gets 30. So it does require a little bit of tracking, but we came up with a really cool little invoice that had our growers across the top and, and we kept track and it wasn't a big deal. So um, it, it was awesome. Like um, Melanie, it was really cool. Like we were, I essentially was in competition with Lindy and we just started working together. We sold way more together, working together than we would have just competing with each other and fighting over forests. So start small and just like figure out your, well, especially here in Utah and Idaho where everything is so spread out, it makes sense. We're hours apart from, we're driving hours on these routes, you know, to get our flowers into the hands of florists. So it does really make sense in a location like ours that we're so spread out, we're literally driving hours to get our flowers into these markets. So find that grower that's already in that town, meet halfway, swap flowers. <laughs> it just, it, it can be fairly simple. And I think co the word co-op sounds scary and it's it maybe, it might seem daunting, but just form, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be as complicated and as scary as, as people can make it out to be. Yeah, that I just want to add that was a game changer because like I said at USU we were we were tracking all of the all of the costs for everything all of our input costs and we did the numbers if we weren't so we want to sell our cut flowers so we know what the market preferences are uh, in pricing and then we can report that through our enterprise budgets and so um, we really relied on Allie and Lindy to do that and, and then I went and looked at okay what would be the mileage be to sell to all these florists if we were going to try to do it too to get pricing um, and giving not giving but them taking 30 percent for selling made our enterprise budgets work if we were individually transporting that to each of the florists the mile we have to ch uh, charge university mileage which is 50 cents per mile plus my students hourly weight everything else and so it made the budget work so trying to pair together um i just think as someone said in the chat collaboration over competition i think that's a wonderful way to kind of wrap up this whole webinar um and to think about flower farming in general too so thank you. Uh, let's see here. So I have a final slide that just has my contact info, but I'd love for the cut flower farmers on the panel, if you're interested in um, 
promoting your farm at all, putting your website in, please feel free to add that into the chat so that everybody has access to it. But if not, that's fine too, of course. And with that, thank you guys so much. We had, I feel like this was so much fun today. We've been together almost two hours and boy has the time flown. Um, just thanks to everyone who's here today uh, and all of the wonderful information that was passed around. So thank you all very much. And I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Oh, Melanie, can I do a couple things? Please, sorry, stay on, don't no, no, go. No. Yeah, one, um, Val has a special offer for folks, you know, she mentioned she's the president of the Cut Flower Association. So I'm gonna drop this in the chat, but Val, if you wanna just quickly mention this. Sure, um, for anybody that's not a member of the Cut Flower Grower Association, um, that the link will give you $50 off your first year membership, if you're interested in that. And um, one of the things that we started doing last year because we couldn't have conferences was to set up farm tours and we've just launched that again for this year and we also have a conference that will be near boston at the end of the year all right fantastic and i'm gonna drop a survey in the chat and if you guys would fill that out for us that would be fantastic to help us know what topics you need, um, what other information we can provide. And we will, you know, this was recorded tonight. So we'll be getting that link out. And what we'll do in there is we'll list out all of our growers from the grower panel and with their social media too. So you can find them super easy and you can go see what kinds of things that they're doing. Um, will the chat be accessible also? I don't know. I'll have to see about that if it, I don't know if it displays on the video or if we can um, put something or maybe we can extract some key things to put as a supplemental information. Maybe we can post on the CCD website where the, where the video link will go up. But yeah, I have to echo what Melanie said. Thank you so much everybody for sticking with us. And it was a great webinar. We could have gone for a couple more hours answering all these questions. And a special thanks to you, Melanie, and a special thanks to all of our growers on the grower panel. You guys were fantastic. I love hearing what you have to say. It's so valuable to hear your um, perspectives and your advice. Um, those of you who uh, are willing to share, we, we, we really do appreciate that. So any last words, Melanie, from you? No less words other than please, if you can take that survey that uh, Cindy dropped in into the chat, that helps us so very much. And thank you for taking the time to do that after the yes. webinar. And it was wonderful uh, seeing all of you and I hope to again sometime. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much.